You can support In the Past Lane by telling your friends about the podcast. Studies show that one of the top ways that people find new podcasts is by word of mouth. So please, talk it up. Thanks. On May 15th, 1902, crowds of angry immigrant Jewish women began to smash the windows of local butcher shops on New York's Lower East Side. Then they burst in and destroyed huge supplies of kosher beef. Eventually, the disturbance was quelled with the arrival of 500 policemen. What enraged the women was what they considered an unjust spike in beef prices. Some observers noted that there were plenty of other options, like chicken and fish available. But the rioters had come to see beef as an essential part of their everyday diet and a key marker of their upward mobility and Americanization. They had become citizens of the Red Meat Republic. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 157, in which we explore the history of the beef industry and how it changed not just America's diet, but also its culture and politics. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Longhorn Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and at our YouTube channel. Leading us, as ever, is the executive producer who prefers her steak rare, Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, I know it's the dog days of summer, but what's with being late for work the past few days? Time is a bourgeois construct used to keep the people down. Hmm, you got a point there. So, what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, I recently got back from a week in San Antonio, Texas, visiting my wife's family. And I'm pleased to say, given the topic of this week's episode, that we had more than our share of grilled steak and a ton of everything from a place called Rudy's Barbecue. If you're in San Antonio, you gotta look up Rudy's. I think there are three of them. Awesome place. But now I'm back attending to all sorts of projects that I couldn't get to during the semester, including cleaning my office and working on this podcast. I've got some really great interviews coming up, so stay tuned. In other news, more of you continue to join the community of patrons who support this podcast by donating via Patreon. Thanks to Dion for joining at the $1 per month level. And Harriet, who joined at the $5 per month level. Huzzah! This support is so important because it helps pay for the cost of producing this podcast. And if anyone else wants to help out, please just go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. Thanks. All right, I think it's time to get to our main feature, my interview with historian Joshua Specht. Okay, people, I know I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to anyway. I hope you'll forgive me. It's time to get hoofing. Your journey in the past lane begins... Now. If you watch TV in the 1980s, you probably remember this tagline from a famous series of commercials for the fast food chain Wendy's. It featured an elderly and clearly perturbed Clara Peller being served a skimpy hamburger on a giant bun, prompting her to demand, Where's the beef? And if you watched TV in the 1990s, you likely saw many versions of the American Beef Council's jaunty commercials showing endless versions of meals featuring beef that always ended with the line, Beef, it's what's for dinner. These iconic ad campaigns highlight America's love affair with red meat. And even though beef consumption has declined by about a third since the mid-1970s, Americans still consume more red meat than any nation on Earth. But beef was not always the centerpiece of the U.S. diet. Before the Civil War, the most common meat source was pork. But after the Civil War, as white migrants, railroads, and the U.S. Army spread out across the Great Plains, cattle ranching emerged as a major industry. Over time, as entrepreneurs and investors figured out how to get cattle from Texas onto the Great Plains, and then to the great slaughterhouse operations in Chicago, 
and then how to move large slabs of beef to regional wholesalers, who then sold to local butchers, who in turn sold retail cuts of beef to local customers, beef became affordable and widely available. Americans came to expect beef several times a week. So too did immigrants, who wrote letters home to their families in Europe, extolling America as a place of freedom, opportunity, and beef. How this incredible transition occurred is the subject of a fascinating new book, Red Meat Republic, A Hoof-to-Table History of How Beef Changed America, by Joshua Specht. Joshua Specht teaches history at Monash University in Australia, and in the course of our conversation he explains how beef went from a special occasion food that was raised locally to an everyday staple produced by a vast national market, how dispossessing Native Americans of their land was a crucial early step in the formation of a booming beef industry, how that process relied not on plucky pioneers, but rather on the raw power of the federal government via the U.S. military and support for a national railroad network how and why massive, heavily capitalized industrial ranching in the Gilded Age failed, causing investors to shift capital to the meat processing industry centered in Chicago. How, as beef became cheap and plentiful in the late 19th century, it became a key cultural marker for white middle-class success, especially among immigrants to the U.S. The emergence of four great meatpacking companies, including Swift and Armour, and how they used new technology and government policy to revolutionize their industry. How the insistence on low prices led beef packers to ruthlessly exploit their workers, a process famously chronicled by Upton Sinclair in The Jungle. How one of the great challenges today is to reconnect the costs of low beef prices to the conditions that make them possible, exploited workers, government subsidies, and environmental damage. Joshua Specht, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Thanks so much for having me on. Your book examines the rise of the U.S. beef industry in the 19th century and how, by 1900, the U.S. had become a nation of beef eaters. But before we dive into that story, I think our listeners would benefit from some context and background. So could you tell us how much meat were Americans consuming roughly, let's say, in 1860, and where did it come from? So I think this is, it's important to kind of get a baseline. The first thing I'd say is in the 19th century, getting kind of hard or reliable quantitative data on how much people ate is kind of hard. So we have to rely mm-hmm. on you know, kind of accumulated accounts and, and discussion of it. But I would say, you know, before the American Civil War, first of all, the amount of meat you ate varied a lot geographically. Mm -hmm. So people in rural areas were eating more. People in cities were often eating much less. And in addition to that, I would say that meat markets were largely regional. So you would have cattle raising kind of dotting, particularly we're talking about fresh meat. Right. Cattle raising kind of dotting the fringes of the country's cities. They would be sold in markets like the Brighton Cattle Market near Boston. And then that will kind of enter into the urban food economy. And so you get these set of regional markets all across the U.S. That means that, A, generally meat is going to be more expensive. It's being consumed less, particularly among poor Americans in cities. And that the fact that that kind of class differentiation, regional differentiation, all disappears over the course of my story is, is one of the major changes. Right, that beef becomes sort of universal, national and universal, and yeah. in, every way, in every way possible. Well, let's get to the origin of that and how that process begins. Mm -hmm. And the first key step that you outline is in this emergence of what you call the the cattle beef complex is the transformation of the American West or in particular the Great Plains. And this is a transformation that is physical, it's environmental, it's demographic. And of course, it involves technology and something you emphasize quite heavily, which is politics and policy. Mm -hmm. So tell us about what has to happen first for the creation of the, the site in which this transformation is going to begin. Well, one thing I do that's slightly different in the book, I think, is I I try to emphasize heavily the origins of the land that cattle are grazing on. And so I view the the kind of violent process of dispossessing American Indian land as central to creating modern beef. And so I think the start of the story is an abundance of cattle across the plains. Now, in the Midwest, cattle raising had been very important. It remains enormously important in the late 19th century. But really, it was the creation of this broader national system of of cattle raising on the plains that then connects to the Midwest and connects to the rest of the U.S. that is key. And so what happens in the West is you have, on the one hand, a system that looks very much the same. So you start the story with American Indians who live off the hunt of bison, and they're enabled to do that by their reliance on horses. Well, you could say after this whole process, you have cattlemen, cowboys, ranchers riding horses to deal with a large grazing animal that then underpins the local economy. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's viewed radically differently by people at the time. 
And I like to think of cattle ranching as both a tool for the dispossession of American Indian lands and a justification of that process. Right. So cattle allow people to both occupy land and kind of the cattle spread far and wide, which is a way to use it. But then also this idea that cattle raising is a quote unquote higher use for the land is very powerful in terms of justification. So you get government officials saying things in the 1880s like a quote, barren waste Mm -hmm. has been converted to a scene of enterprise and thrift. Right. And that narrative of wasted land and underutilized resources is is a really powerful one that we see throughout the 19th century. And it is that sort of broad pretext for dispossessing the land and bringing what they termed higher civilization. So removing Native Americans becomes crucial, either outright killing them and or putting them onto reservations. That's one part. And there are other aspects of this as well, which involve, you know, in both cases, the government. Uh, One is the use of the military in this process. Oh, yeah. And the other is the emergence of the railroad. Tell us how these things all connect, because I think that's one of the the fascinating parts of your book is how things that seem to many people's observation to be separate parts of American history are actually intimately connected. Yeah. One of the kind of myths I want to try to undo, although historians are are more obviously have covered this somewhat, is this kind of romantic image of the West as this place that doesn't have big government, doesn't have big business. And in my story, I both trace the tension between the power of that myth, that it doesn't have those things, and the reality that it does. Mm -hmm. And so what I argue is that a big, powerful state is very important for the story. So the U.S. military is often supporting the efforts of early cattle ranchers. And also you get cattle ranching emerging as a big business in the 1880s. You get big corporate ranches. And those, very importantly, tie into the nation's emerging rail network. So so part of what's driving the expansion of the rail network beyond the kind of main trunk lines is the distribution of commodities and the connection of commodities from rural places. And in my case, it's very much cattle. And what you get that's so interesting about the kind of development of the West in my story is in the aftermath of the American Civil War, the nation's rail network is very much east-west organized around Chicago, Mm -hmm. you know, for reasons that are maybe a bit outside the scope of this story. But the orientation of of cattle production in the West is very much north-south across the Great Plains. And so you have to come up with a way to kind of link those things. And you start to get railroads pushing into these towns in places like Kansas, and you get the era of the kind of long cattle drive in which 10 or 12 cattle workers may move, you know, 3,000 animals 1,000 miles to Kansas from Texas or, Mm -hmm. or Colorado. And so it's a story very much about political relationships that are building those railroads, about local people trying to vie for access to those railroads, as well as these kind of business, emerging ranches as business, kind of connecting the dots. Yeah. And it, like you said, has so many different connections to so many different things. And it does really challenge those fundamental underpinnings of the myth of the West as this place separate from the East, separate from oh, yeah. the industrializing uh, economy, and separate from any sense of any need for government. And of course, government, both big and small, is is a really key part of this overall story. And you focus on these sort of macro level questions, mm-hmm. but also individuals. And yeah. you highlight a number of people that are quite fascinating, but not well known, like Susan Newcomb oh, yeah. and ranchers like that. Tell us a little bit more about who these early ranchers are. Yeah, sure. So one of the things I think you kind of got right at the heart of what I'm trying to do with the book, so that was encouraging. I think one of the things I'm trying to do is talk about these big transformations we see as structural, but tell them not just through a human scale, but argue that they actually grow from kind of conflict on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand how these interactions between individual people aggregate into structural change. Um, And so I tell stories. And so one of the people I look at is Susan Newcomb. Susan Newcomb is not born in Texas, but as a teenage bride, she moves with her husband, Samuel Newcomb, to the area around Fort Davis, Texas, and kind of West Texas into the panhandle. And she makes a life there. She keeps a diary. And from her diary, we can see both the interaction between these kind of early ranchers and the military as they kind of live in the Mm -hmm. shadow of these forts, as they agitate for military support of what they're doing. And we also see the importance of the kind of ideology of, of Western progress. You see her hoping that God will stretch forth his helping hand, kind of civilize the land. You see her never really questioning her right to be in this place that she somehow simultaneously hates, but believes it important to kind of stay in and build up. Roughly what decade are we talking about here with Newcomb? So her diary is is late 1860s. Right. So a good representative figure. And they represent that sort of early version of, of ranching. And another dimension that you explore 
a little bit further down the road is the emergence of large-scale ranching, really industrialized ranching, Mm -hmm. one that is heavily capitalized, involving investors from far, far away. And, you know, like anything else that's happening industrially in this Gilded Age period, there's a sense that scale is necessary and scale will make things more efficient and more profitable. But it doesn't go that way because there's other factors involved here, like the weather and such. So tell us the sort of rise and fall of this experiment. Yeah, so I argue that the key to explain, A, kind of kickstarting this this cattle beef complex, but also one thing that explains its structure is a boom and bust in in corporate cattle ranching in basically the first half of Mm -hmm. the 1880s is the most exuberant period. And so once you get U.S. military control of places like the Southern Plains, the Central Plains, you start to get investors in the U.S. Northeast or as far away as Scotland funneling capital, driving capital into these areas to build these huge huge herds. So they buy up all the local ranchers who might have had a thousand animals and they assemble hundred thousand herd ranches. And they really start to put ranching on a kind of business footing. The problem is that at the same time, they're really working this as a kind of business. I argue that the way you engage in open range ranching collides with the needs of capital for a kind of rational process. So the way you make money in 19th century cattle ranching in the West Mm -hmm. is you basically scatter your animals far and wide because you can turn marginal unusable land into profits as long as the cattle can get enough of this not very nutritious grass. And so at the same time that you have ranch managers like William Somerville talking about how you can't quite actively manage the animals profitably, you get investors demanding precision. Mm -hmm. And so there turns into this weird kind of performance for investors of the precision of ranching at the same time that profits are founded on not really knowing too closely what's going on. Mm -hmm. And at particular moments, particularly surrounding the weather, there are a couple of bad blizzards in the late 1880s, investors panic. And they actually demand an accounting of how many cattle their ranches have. Turns out they don't have nearly as many. And the whole thing kind of explodes. And everybody is profitable for a while, but everybody loses money. But this is really important because it builds up Western ranching, A, and that ranching kind of collapses at the same time that the Chicago meatpackers are gaining power. So that explains how they take over the story in part. Yeah, so the shift of power moves from these large potential corporate ranches to the slaughterhouses. Yeah. And one of the points you make is that the lesson learned uh, by the people who go through this process of the failure of corporate ranching is that small-scale ranching is actually a better way to go and it's advantageous to the emerging power players mm-hmm. in these slaughterhouses in, in Chicago. Tell us a little bit more about how that system works out and how it really persists in many ways up to the present day. So one of the themes I try to talk about in the book, and you know, these are bigger ideas that I'm still thinking through, but there's kind of a compromise between, as I've suggested, the kind of need for rationality from capital and the unpredictability of nature. And in the corporate ranching period, that tension is never resolved. And I argue that leads to the total collapse of it. But one of the ways they ultimately resolve that tension is making the highly capitalized and profitable parts of this supply chain or story Mm meatpacking. And so ranching by being kind of small scale and relatively less profitable creates a much more stable system, right? Because there's so many different actors, no actor going out of business hurts things too much. But also when fewer animals are being managed, people kind of work more carefully. They can keep things under control but they can make less money. And so the profitable centers of power shift, but this kind of serves the interest of the entire system. It's also exceedingly unlikely that they'll ever band together. Exactly. Oh, that's that's really... Union or or organization of of ranchers either. So the decentralization has that aspect as well. Yeah, and they try to organize politically and they can't. And what happens is they end up in a situation they've basically been in since then that their ranchers face today, which is that they're kind of getting fleeced by beef processors, but they are also reliant on them and they can't organize politically. You're exactly right. And so by this point... The reason there's so much interest, corporate and investor interest in beef, is that it is becoming a, a staple of the American diet. Maybe we could shift our conversation there. That yeah. How does beef you know, become this thing that people expect and that people talk about incessantly and just, you know, recipes are circulated in newspapers and immigrants when they write home about how great things are going, always seeming yeah. to talk about how much meat they're having and how many times a week. So how does, tell us more about how the red meat republic emerges. Yeah. So I kind of, when I started this research, you know, just started reading about this, I kind of assumed it was going to be in part a story of the Chicago meatpackers convincing people to eat beef all the time, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and what I realized actually is they had a kind of endless market once they could persuade people that their food wasn't going to poison them. Mm. And so I started to think about why. And I guess what I realized, and, and reading some of the other secondary literature as well, is basically the kinds of people who are moving to the U.S. from Europe, almost all the different places they're coming from, beef is a special occasion food. Mm-hmm. So it's food they want, but they only have on maybe a feast day or another kind of religious holiday. And so when they come to America, they can have an occasional food all the time. And what that means is all of a sudden, their ability to consume beef becomes a metric both for their Americanization and for their success in America. It becomes a way to show that they have a new kind of life and identity, and it becomes hugely important, their access to beef politically. And so some of the best examples in the book are one, I talk about a meat riot in 1902, Mm -hmm. where increasing beef prices lead people to start smashing butcher shop windows. And another interesting one is a very interesting Chinese Exclusion Act pamphlet called Meat vs. Rice. Mm -hmm. And basically, the labor movement makes an argument in favor of exclusion, unfortunately, that the American worker survives on meat, whereas in their kind of racist reading, the Chinese worker survives on rice, and that If you bring in this labor competition that survives on rice, then the standard of the American worker focused on beef will be dragged down, and that will both destroy American manhood and the strength of the worker. So we see all these kind of cultural resonances around beef. Right. And you cite a passage from the essay by Beard in which he really globalizes that and sort of talks about the you know the rise and fall of civilizations and races that eat meat are the dominant races and that those that do not they've contributed very little to the rise of civilization. So there's emerging race theories that we typically see when talking about immigration or reconstruction policy are actually closely tied to beef, of all things. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting in a way because everybody wants beef, but the politics are actually sort of incoherent. So he's got these racial theories, but at the same time, other elite Americans are writing with great anxiety about poor Americans eating too much beef or beef that's too fancy. And they're actually looking around the world and with their own racial theories saying, look at these workers who survive on just potatoes, whether it's in Ireland or just rice in China in their reading. And so they're saying, actually, maybe we should teach our workers to survive without this meat. But in everything, meat is the kind of highest goal in a way, and that's what secures this market. Right. So beef becomes sort of indispensable to not just the basic diet, but also the way Americans think about themselves, the way new Americans think about themselves. Yeah. And part of the story that we've already touched on it, the rise of the meat packers become so important. Mm -hmm. Tell us more about that. They emerge in Chicago, and ultimately there are four of these companies, two best known ones are Armour and Swift, that they come to dominate this process and how they, prior to their emergence, Americans got their meat from local butchers. The cattle itself may have come from far away Mm -hmm. at at a certain point, but tell us how the decline of butchers and the rise of these centralized processing entities. So I think one thing to understand about it is their ultimate goal actually really was to kind of have a revolution behind the scenes. They didn't want consumers thinking about them too much. Mm -hmm. So this is a slight oversimplification, but they actually didn't really want to be doing a retail business if they could avoid it. So there would still be retail butchers who kind of understood their community, had relationships, knew about local variation. The Chicago meatpackers, what they really wanted to do was to replace wholesalers. So kind of regional players who slaughtered the animal, who sent kind of halves or quarters of a carcass to retail butchers. And they wanted to make every butcher in America in a retail sense dependent on Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so that was their real goal. And that way, the consumers wouldn't necessarily know too much about this industrial process, but they would control everything. And once they had enough of a market, obviously, they could drive retail butchers out of business, get and secure any kind of bigger contract, et cetera. And they did it a few ways. I mean, one of the key claims in the book is that these big meatpacking companies realize the way to make money isn't so much to compete with each other, but it's to, to capture more and more of the food dollar from either end of their supply chain. Mm-hmm. So they fleece ranchers as much as possible, in part by colluding to not bid against each other in cattle auctions. And then they kind of drive rival butchers out of business and force retail butchers to sign up with them. One of the ways they do that is basically with predatory pricing. Mm -hmm. They sell their beef at such a low price that no one can compete. And they have a very clever argument, right? If you're selling computers or, I don't know, tires at a predatory price, you know, they're never going to go bad. But what the meatpackers say is, well, these cuts of beef are going to go bad. So if people don't buy it, we're going to keep cutting prices until they do. Mm-hmm. And they use that to justify this whole theme to eventually get consumers on board. Right. And in the process of their emergence, they've got this 
way of doing business, but they also, I mean, they are the epitome of the modern corporation. Oh, yeah. And again, we, we tend to think of that as being something more like Carnegie and Steel, you know, that we think mm. of more familiarly as industrial because there's smokestacks and all. But these folks in Chicago are pioneering many of the most basic and important corporate practices, yeah. starting with the mechanized assembly line, which many people think Henry Ford mm -hmm. invented, but he just sort of adapted it to his own purposes later. Yeah. In his memoirs, he mentions watching Chicago dressed beef as being part of the idea. In this case, a disassembly line, right? We're taking one mm -hmm. thing and making a bunch. But, you know, it's pioneered in actually in Cincinnati a bit earlier, but dealing with processing animal carcasses. And the Chicago meat packers turn it into, in a way, an art form, right? And the key is the, is the division of labor. They break it into smaller and smaller tasks which means everyone is synchronized. So the slowest worker has to work at the pace of the fastest worker. They can train people better, or more quickly, rather. And so workers become easily replaceable. And so one of the things I stress is that the disassembly line, it's not that it magically makes people more efficient, although there's some of that. It also just makes it easier to kind of exploit your workers and force them to work at maximum speed. And so what you get, particularly before those kind of industrial safety and effective unionization, you get an enormously efficient but also exploitative and dangerous regime. That leads to stories like a 14-year-old boy I talk about named Vincenz Rutkowski, who is kind of maimed by an accident in the slaughterhouse as he's overworked. And later quintessentially captured by Upton Sinclair in his book, The Jungle, yeah. which, as he famously said, he was trying to convert people to socialism, but he ended up really just grossing them out but, <laughs> and getting them to support the Pure Food and Drug Act yeah. and the Meat Inspection Act. But the heart and soul of that story is, is exploitation and the cruelties visited upon these vulnerable, sure. easily replaced immigrant uh, workers. And that's another, we can get to it a little bit later, but that's another continuity with the present, which is that who are working in contemporary slaughterhouses today recently arrived immigrants. Yeah. One thing that you point out, which I think is really important and is, seems to be an emerging theme in much of American historiography these days, is sort of taking on the inevitability tale of anything. In this case, the rise of the modern meatpacking corporations. And by doing so, the point is to show that nothing is inevitable. And emergence of these meatpacking titans and the national and then ultimately global industry they pioneer mm -hmm. is not a natural outgrowth of just stuff that happens, but it's the outgrowth of choices and policies and politics. Before we dive into that, let's talk about how the idea that it was inevitable was sort of normalized, uh, starting with people like Armour and then also picked up by historians to sort of talk about the rise of the meatpacking industry is purely a story of new technology that just magically transforms things. Yeah. I mean, that's a really important theme. And I, I have hope to get at it. Although it's kind of funny as a historian, you kind of, I don't know if you've had this experience, but you kind of go back and forth. And, and probably every three months, I'd kind of wake up nervously and think, is it inevitable? Maybe yeah. it all is. <laughs> it um, is one of those interesting questions. <laughs> yeah. But I guess I want to say like, I guess they, part of the job, right, is to explore developments that were more likely or highly likely and contrast those from ones that were not and were right. contingent. And I think, you know, the way I think about it is people like Armour, when he's investigated by the Senate, right, he makes this argument that the industry has, in his saying, quote, different rules. And the idea is that feeding lots of people in, in the modern age means things work fundamentally differently. And that gets taken up by the first great historian of, of meatpacking, who's also kind of tied to the industry, a kind of amazing guy named Rudolf Clemen, who talks about this technological change, as well as the kind of genius of people like Armour. He was affiliated with the Armour Livestock Bureau, so this isn't too surprising. But also you get this idea of inevitability. I mean, you even see it in the writings of Teddy Roosevelt, which is, you know, capitalism has to be tamed because the centralization is how it's going to work. And what I think about it a lot is the story they tell is in a sense accurate. You know, I, I think that new technology changes things a lot, but it's not the entirety of the story. And they're telling it as the entirety of the story. Yeah. So my goal is to kind of tell the half the story they have right with the other half of the story of human struggle, contingent processes. And I think the way I think about that is this logic of price, which is that low prices become the kind of organizing principle of the entire system. And so at every different step, these contingent processes kind of trend towards lower prices for the public. And then that ends up depending on huge amounts of exploitation. And then a little bit later, one of the things that the meatpackers realize is that you know, low cost is crucial for this consumer product, but also sanitation and cleanliness. Yeah. That if you can provide this beef at a low price and guarantee more or less to the consumer that it's not going to kill them or their children, then you've achieved the two essentials. Tell us more about that, because that also relies on 
the intervention of the government again to ensure yeah. this process has this sort of legitimacy. Well, I think the first thing is, in some sense, I was writing this and I was thinking, well, maybe this is just obvious, right? Because if you think about it, we can care about all these abstract things about commodities, but with something you eat, if you think it's going to poison you, that's going to be kind of the more immediate concern than anything else. Unlikely if, you can, if it's important to you and you can't afford it. But what I wanted to do in the book is A, tell a commodity story and what I view as kind of immediate cultural meanings of any commodity, kind of make us focus on that story and ignore the production side. But I think that's particularly the case with food, right? We kind of buy it almost half-made. We buy these pieces of meat. We prepare it at home in our ways that might be culturally bounded, and we consume it. And so anything that hurts that kind of home or restaurant process is going to reflect back on the story of the commodity. But if everyone's happy with everything, well, then, then it, you're only focused on the kind of immediate story of that product or good. And so I think what I trace in a way around sanitation and price is how an industry solves both consciously and, and perhaps just accidentally these two main consumer fears, right? They latch onto price as a defense against charges of collusion and also just to get consumers. And they see the fear that books and exposés like The Jungle produce around sanitation. And one of the reasons that the only truly, I think, really successful state intervention on this around issues of sanitation is successful is in part because that ultimately serves the interest of industry, mm. right? It's good for the meat packers that people trust their food. And once they do, every other kind of exploitative aspect of the industry becomes in some sense invisible. Right. So things that were intimately tied to this, like how that meat ends up on your plate eventually, yeah. things like the other aspects in the jungle, for that matter, the exploitation of labor, the exactly. incredibly cruel processes by which animals are slaughtered. So questions of animal welfare. And then the bigger macro level questions about that we are much more concerned about, much more aware of today, the impact of all this beef consumption on, on the environment, all that gets sort of pushed out of sight, out of consciousness, because the really question is, can I afford it? And is it quote unquote healthy? Yeah. I mean, I think that's key then. And I think it remains relevant today, for sure. Speaking of today, why don't we jump towards contemporary questions and how your book ties to that. What is it that's in this story of the, the rise of the red meat republic and the meat industry and the consumption of beef and all of the cultural questions and things that come with that? How does that tie into what we're talking about today and what we're concerned about today? And it's pretty obvious in many ways, but why don't you get us started in that direction? Yeah. I mean, I think it's really interesting. I'll, I'll start with two caveats. The first is obviously as a historian, I'm going out on a limb. And I like to think of myself more as providing a set of information than that people thinking about stuff today can draw from. Mm -hmm. The only other caveat, and after this, I'm going to be perfectly happy to go on about contemporary stuff. The only other caveat is that obviously people in, in my period didn't think about climate change in the same way, right. despite the fact that I'm about to talk a bit about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what I think of today, you know, I trace in the politics of this, particularly in terms of the kind of state level politics, mm -hmm. capitalist state, that this low price argument that any change will increase prices to consumers is one we have to take very seriously. And so I think the key to thinking about the kind of problems of today's food system is simultaneously thinking about changes that will in fact end up increasing prices, but also having to tie that to some sort of understanding or system of social justice, making people more able to afford the meat they eat if it is produced in a kind of quote unquote better way. And that's very important so that more environmentally responsible beef doesn't just become a kind of niche product for the wealthy. Right. I think because we have to be aware of the class implications as I trace in my story. The other thing I think is worth thinking about is how this kind of relationship I try to argue between, for lack of a better word, nature, and for lack of a better word, capital, affects debates today and how the kind of risk of all these processes is displaced onto other actors who aren't the kind of highly profitable pieces of the story. And that explains why environmental costs are so hard to tie back into the story mm -hmm. or so hard to address, right? The people with the most power in the system, the food processors and some of the kind of big agribusinesses, they don't actually bear any of the responsibility. I mean, they bear responsibility in our sense, but they don't actually carry any of the costs of environmental impact. Right. So restoring that link, I think, is very important. On the other hand, we also can't just embrace an idea of total decentralization because I think we have to recognize the very real gains the system brought to people. In terms of overall quality and... Yeah, quality, prices, you know, people like mm -hmm. meat. You know, for, for me to say, well, the solution is just to not eat meat, that's a bit of a cop-out, right? Because you can't say that with every food. Every food product has its own problems and every commodity is the same. 
So we need to be sympathetic to the fact that this is a important food source that became affordable, that gave a lot of people meaning, and we have to act in light of that. So I think that you, it can't just be a total just condemnation of this entire system as if we could throw it out and solve all our problems. Right. And and we already see that, you know, since the, even the 1970s, beef consumption had, you know, had begun to decline and, oh, yeah. you know, it's been replaced by other forms of meat, chicken and pork in, in particular. There is, does seem to be a bigger food conversation in the United States now than there was even 10 years ago. And it seems to me a growing awareness that all these things are connected, that the hamburger you eat is actually connected to everything from soil erosion to climate change and labor practices, maybe not so much on that yeah. side. But but again, even now with the five the $15 minimum wage, it's focusing yeah. on fast food workers at places like McDonald's. So it's interesting to see, and it's not, you know, we can't predict where it goes, but there does seem to be a, a growing awareness of how these things are connected. I guess one other question to ask you about the contemporary situation is the global situation, mm. that we are a red meat republic, but red meat is spreading fast and wide throughout the world with big questions about its impact. Yeah. The first half of what you were saying about people thinking about how these things are connected, this is kind of a heartening development that is different from, in a way, the story I tell, right? I was just telling you this whole argument that if people are satisfied with the price and satisfied it's not going to poison them, they don't really care about the production process. Yeah. Well, that's starting to change. I think you're exactly right. Since the 1970s, people are thinking about how their food is produced. Not everyone. It's still not even a majority, probably, but it's in the conversation in a way I just didn't see in my period. Mm -hmm. And I think my story, by saying it's so total, is kind of to try to constantly push those people to keep thinking about production, but thinking about it broadly, and to ensure that any solution doesn't have this kind of elite or class stratified nature. Mm -hmm. And so I think pushing that totality to kind of go ma more mainstream, it, it, there's a lot of promise there, but it's also got some ways to go. Your point about global, I, I think, is, yeah, that's really interesting. I think of it as kind of the model I explore in, in Red Meat Republic is become a global. So maybe it's kind of a red meat globe because mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to say is all these attendant problems with beef production are the result of a particular industrial model and this kind of constant public demand for beef in quantities as large as possible. And I think because beef was such a metric of success in the United States, and the United States has a global image of being a very wealthy, successful country, that's a big part of the global middle class's embrace of beef, right? So, so mm. the exact meanings of beef that oddly are born of a combination of the specificity of the United States spreading to a kind of growing immigrant populations in the U.S., all of a sudden that kind of specific story is setting the template for global desires around beef, and obviously, um, the American model of meat processing has taken off. Now, one thing that's interesting is, is the most powerful meat processor in the world is actually a Brazilian company today, JBS. And they, mm -hmm. they actually bought Swift about 10 or 15 years ago. But yeah, so this, this has really taken off. And all the trends I see in my story that are national have now become global. A lot of the, the kind of strategies I trace are evident today globally. So it's an ongoing story. Yeah. Well, Joshua Speck, thank you. Uh, this has been a great conversation and really illuminating, especially as we head into the backyard grilling season. <laughs> Think about uh, the meat products and, and their, where they've come from and, of course, the history that, that's attached to them. So thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us at In the Past Lane. Okay. That was, that was really helpful. Your thoughts were so interesting. Thank you. Joshua Speck is the author of Red Meat Republic, a hoof to table history of how beef changed America published by Princeton University Press and available wherever books are sold. And you can follow Joshua on Twitter at Josh Specht. That's J-O-S-H-S-P-E-C-H-T. If you like this episode, you can show your appreciation by purchasing some of our merchandise. We've got all sorts of history-themed t-shirts, like Historians Against History Repeating Itself, which also comes in many variations, like history majors and history students and history teachers against history repeating itself. And we've got some great history quote t-shirts like this one by Confucius, Study the past if you would define the future, and one featuring an African proverb, Until the lions have their historians, tales of the hunt shall always glorify the hunter. And there's lots more. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on merchandise. Thanks. Okay, past laners, as always, this has been a lot of fun. But alas, we are out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. 
And please, leave a starred review. Thanks. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, I hear your grilled steak is amazing. What kind of seasoning do you use? Edibles. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 